I'm waving like an idiot. <laughs> I'm waving like an idiot. <laughs> Okay, I think this means we're, uh, we're good to go. So, hello, thanks for joining us for Bookbound 2020, a From Home Literary Festival. My name is Octavia Bright, and I'm here to host the discussion between authors Claire Pooley and Chelsea Flood. This event has been curated in partnership with the Wasafiri magazine to raise money for the UK-based mental health charity, Mind. Mind provides advice and support to empower people experiencing mental health problems. Their statistics show that on average, one in four people will experience a mental health problem in a typical year. And as we all know, 2020 is really not a typical year. So um, we couldn't think of a better charity to be supporting in this completely bonkers time. Um, you can make your donation to support Mind by using the link to Bookbound Just Giving page, which is displayed below. Um, we're really close to meeting the target. So maybe this can be the event that gets us there. So please um, give generously while you listen to these two great authors have a chat. Um, you can find out more about Bookbound, Wasafiri, Mind, and our authors by visiting our website, bookbound2020.co.uk. And now on to our event. So joining me via the gracious uh, space of the internet is Claire Pooley, former advertising executive and author of the blog, Mummy Was a Secret Drinker, the memoir, The Sober Diaries, and novel, The Authenticity Project and Chelsea Flood, who is the author of two young adult novels, Infinite Sky and Night Wanderers, and is currently working on a memoir about accidentally getting sober. She writes about this at her blog, Beautiful Hangover. So Chelsea and Claire, welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, hi, Octavia. Hi. hi. <laughs> so the title of this discussion is Authentic Authors. So we're gonna be talking obviously about authenticity and writing. Um, as I just described in your intros, you both write memoir and also fiction. So I'd like to start by asking you both to tell us a bit about your writing. So Chelsea, let's start with you. Um, as we said, you've published two YA novels and also write your blog, The Beautiful Hangover. Why did you start blogging about sobriety, drinking? Um, what led you to that? Well, I suppose it was, um... It was something that I wanted to do for a long time was to uh, stop drinking or to moderate my drinking. And so I kind of accidentally went on a quest to solve the problem of my drinking. And along the way, I learned so much that I started to actually feel really inspired and wanted to share with people all of the revelations that I was having. Because I, I felt like I hadn't been having a lot of revelations for a while. I'd been quite stuck. And um I was sort it sort of was like the opposite of growth for quite a, a while it felt like and then as after I started to work out what was going on with my drinking and how to solve that um I was just having all these epiphanies and I I really wanted to share them because I just really felt like there would be a lot of people having a similar experience and I felt like it was an important conversation I really wanted to join in but also it's very nerve-wracking a conversation to join in too so I, I kind of ummed and ahed about it for ages but in the end I just couldn't help myself I just wanted to start writing I was writing about it I always write so much you know it's always part of my healing process and uh, getting sober was about healing too in some ways so I was writing a lot and then it was just a matter of time before I wanted to share it with people and I started the blog. 
Makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you say you um denied about it, what were your reservations? Oh, well, it sounds like such a small thing to stop drinking, but actually it was a huge identity shift for me and it was a really transformative thing and my whole life changed as a result of me quitting drinking. So it was, it felt like emerging as a different person. Like I had all of these different opinions and they were quite challenging to the opinions that I'd held before as a drinker. And so all of the people that I'd known before who I drink with and my family, I felt sort of um, like awkward about this new version of myself. And, and that's partly why I wanted to write the blog too though, because I wanted to find my new people, you know, not that I was getting rid of all the old people, but I wanted to sort of, um, find the people that shared the same sort of opinions that I was starting to hold now. And Claire, did you have similar motivations when you started Mummy Was a Secret Drinker? Uh, yeah, similar in many ways. Um, I mean, I'd always loved writing when I was younger um, and I wrote a diary for years and years and years. And then when I got to my early 20s, I had a big job in advertising in London and I just stopped writing. I just you know, didn't find the time. I, I spent the whole time drinking and working. Um, and um, it wasn't until um, I hit my mid forties and realized that my um, alcohol intake was completely out of control, um, that I started writing again. And I started writing really as, as therapy. So, you know, I was, for me, the idea of quitting drinking was so scary and frightening that I thought, I just had this urge to write about it. And, you know, rather than write in a diary, I thought, well, no, we're now in, in the new millennium and I really should to get up to date and sort of do it in a blog. But I really wasn't expecting anyone to read it initially. So I wrote it very much like writing a, a diary. And um, I just wrote about what I was feeling each day. And, um, and the act of writing was, you know, just made, you know, made helped me make sense of things and it made me feel much more relaxed. And I was able to sort of, you know, to process some of the information I found. I did a whole load of research about, you know, how alcohol um, affects the mind and the body and, and everything else. And I, I shared that in the blog. Um, so, so yeah, so it was, you know, Chelsea, Chelsea said, um, said something about sort of having to write. And, and it was the same with, for me, it was a compulsion. It wasn't that I felt I ought to, I, I really felt I had to. And if I didn't write, if there was any single day when I wasn't writing, I would feel edgy. So, so yeah, so it really was a compulsion. And Claire, do you think it helped um, with accountability as well? Uh, yeah, because what happened is, you know, as people found my blog and, and hundreds of thousands of people found it, I still have no idea quite how, um, but as people found it, I, I found a tribe, which again, you know, Chelsea talked about needing to find your people and, you know, the blog got me a tribe and, and I really did feel that, you know, if I fell off the wagon, then I would take a whole load of people down with me, like a load of dominoes. And, and I felt responsible for, for the people that were following the blog. And that really helped me to sort of stay on the straight and narrow because, you know, I didn't do AA. I didn't do any of the sort of, you know, I, I didn't tell anyone in my real life initially what I was going through. So my blog was my only outlet. Um, and uh, yeah, and the whole, my whole writing career really went on from there. And Chelsea, did do you have similar experience where you had readers who you felt you had to show up for once you started writing? Yeah, I think the readers really make a difference, especially at the beginning when it felt like a huge risk because as my drinking had be, become more problematic, I had, hadn't had really been able to write very much at all because uh, one of the big reasons I quit was because of how it was affecting my mental health and I was so anxious that I just my thoughts were just sort of racing so much so much of the time and I just wasn't able to write and I wasn't even really able to read and so when I started my blog um, it was amazing that I was inspired and writing again but it also felt like a real risk because it was such a departure from what I'd been writing before as the YA so whenever I got and still to this day whenever I get an email from someone who's reading saying that uh, they're so glad that I've taken the time to write this this is exactly what they're feeling it, it still means a, an awful lot and it still helps me to keep 
doing it and to keep expressing myself and this this level of vulnerability which isn't very comfortable at all and isn't like what I normally would have done it's like a new a new thing that I've started to do so yeah it makes so much difference it's really important to me this is a question for both of you but we'll start with Chelsea um did you feel able to be your authentic self in the blog straight away because as you say that um that level of vulnerability is sometimes something people have to work up to, right? Um, and sometimes it's something that happens because we're skinless and raw and 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 very kind of, um, yeah, vulnerable to the world. But I wonder, was it something that came immediately for you or did you have to find your way there? Oops, sorry. It definitely didn't come immediately to me, but the process of getting sober had been this process of opening up and becoming more vulnerable and starting to share what was really going on in my mind with people and starting to really trust people with that stuff and so I think that that process had sort of made me softer and more open and so then when I came to write the blog it it was a bit more natural to do it but also no still it was it felt very strange it felt like a very strange choice because I've always been um you know, a massive overshare with my friends, but not the sort of person that would just, I would never even put like a Facebook status update online before. So it, it did feel quite different. Uh, but I just enjoy writing so much. And when I started to find ways to make it funny sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's quite sad, I, I think, but I just was having such fun with the voice that then that's when the writer part of me just wanted to share. And that part always wins, I think. And what about you, Claire? Did you find it easy to be yourself authentically straight away or, or was well, it a process? Um, I, I did, but only because I cheated and um, I blogged anonymously. Um, so I, I called myself Sober Mummy, um, that was my pseudonym. And, um, and I made very sure that nobody could work out who I was. And I changed details, little details about where I lived and things like that, just to sort of, you know, to be on the safe side, because I was so ashamed about my drinking that, you know, I, I was the only way I could be really honest about what I was going through was to think that nobody who knew me in real life would be able to work out it was me. So it wasn't until about two years later when um, I was on a, about to publish my memoir, because I eventually turned the blog into a memoir called The Sober Diaries. And that was published under my actual name. And um, you know, the few, the few days leading up to publication, I was terrified because you know I was about to publish a book that went through, you know, all my dirty laundry <laughs> in quite a lot of detail, um, and you know, everybody I'd ever known would be able to read it. And that was for me was a really scary point. And you know, I. I learned through that that when you make yourself vulnerable, people are generally really kind, you know. And um, you know, it, it made it made me very brave because I realised that in telling everybody everything, you know, all my secrets, it meant nobody had anything to hurt me with. So you know, I thought, what what are people going to call me? Are they going to call me a lush? You know, well I've done that already. You know, are they going to call me a bad mother? Well, I've, I've done that too. You know. I, I felt there was nothing that people could level at me that I hadn't already leveled at myself. So, you know, it, it um, you know, actually be, making yourself vulnerable, paradoxically, makes you really strong, I, I think. Um, and, uh, and that was a real surprise for me. I think it's very true. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that with stuff like addiction, it, the way society can respond tracks differently for women than for men. Um, there's a writer called Leslie Jameson. I don't know if you've come across her work, but she writes about being sober in sobriety. And um, in one of her the articles, I think, of hers that I read, she says how for men it can be seen like drunkenness and addiction can be seen as like the heroic arc of their destructive nature. And for women, it's, you know, ab abominable. It's, oh, you've got a lovely friend there, Claire, I've just seen. <laughs> Um, for anyone who can't see Claire on the screen right now, there's a dog, you'll see it in a minute. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I was thinking about that, listening to you both now, just talking about, you know, sense of, of shame and anxiety, right? And um, I'm also a sober person and, ha and have written about it. And I think it's something that anyone who gets sober has to figure out a relationship to and around, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that, 
you know, for writing it, there's, writing about your story gives you the chance to, to claim it yourself. And as you said, Claire, to kind of get out in front of any of that societal shame or like cultural shame that can come with it. Um, but I, I want to speak to you both about the shift from the voice of blogging to the voice of actually writing a memoir. And Chelsea, I know your memoir is not published yet, but it's, you know, in the pipeline. Um, because obviously blogging has a sense, I would imagine, of something a bit more immediate and maybe unconscious, whereas obviously a memoir is quite a carefully crafted piece of work. And I, does that resonate? I'll start with you, Chelsea. Does that resonate with you, the difference between those two forms, or was it different for you? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the memoir is, is, is quite different. It has more artistry to it, and it's it's just had so much more time on it. So I've been able to, I've been writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting for a long time because I tend to do that. I tend to write very roughly and then sort of improve it as I go. So so um, it's been really reworked. And also just about the ordering of information becomes such a different thing. So I've been messing around with the timelines. And so yeah, just a lot more consideration has, has gone into it particularly now with the blog, because I write very, very often. So at the beginning, when I was agonizing over whether to actually publish it, because I did write under my name straight away, which I don't know about why I did that really, but I went for it anyway. And um, so I was kind of agonizing for a long time over the blog. So at first I was able to really craft them. And then after a while, I started to just get more into the swing of publishing regularly because another thing was that I wanted to let go of perfectionism, which I'd started to feel really hampered by. Um, partly as a process of becoming a professional writer, I'd started to just have these really high expectations on myself that I actually couldn't live up to myself. And um, I just wanted to be free and I just wanted to join in and stop just being so hard on myself. And uh, again, that was part of what had come through the process of getting sober as well. So that's what I mean. It was like this whole kind of personality shift in lots of different ways that fed into my writing too. Mm. Claire, does that resonate with you as well? Um yeah, yeah, I mean, it absolutely does. I mean, it's, it's funny because um, I think memory is a really strange thing. And, you know, I would have found it really hard to write a memoir if I hadn't got my blog post to refer back to, because, you know, you look back at the time, like the early days of being sober, and it's really hard to remember exactly what it felt like. Um, and I think, you know, we have ways of protecting ourselves as well from stuff that we don't really want to, sorry, that's my dog in the foreground again. Um, you have ways of protecting yourself from things you don't want to, to remember. Um, so, you know, in the Sober Diaries, I talk not just about, you know, the early days of not drinking, but eight months after I got sober, I got breast cancer. And, um, and so I go through, um, you know, what it felt like to, to be diagnosed with breast cancer and then go through breast cancer treatment. Um, and, uh, and so, so the, the memoir sort of is over, takes place over the course of that year, which was a pretty traumatic year, as you can imagine. And, you know, shortly after, when I came out the other side of, of the breast cancer treatment, you know, there were whole chunks of my life that I'd almost entirely forgotten because I think I'd sort of just made myself forget how awful it was and you know but I had of those blog posts I'd written every single day and I was able to go back and remind myself exactly how it felt so when I was writing the memoir I had I had that as reference and I'm not sure I could have I don't think I could have written anything as authentic if I'd been relying on my own memory and not my actual writings um, and then, so, so I use those blog posts to, to sort of structure the, the memoir. But then it was really interesting because my editor, um, when she read the first draft, she said, um, okay, now you need to think of it as, as if it were a novel. So, you know, so once you've got your sort of, you know, you, you've got the, you know, the, the real story down, you sort of need to go back and almost, you know, think about pacing and characterization and plot and timelines and everything in the same way that you would if it were a novel to make sure that it's readable enough for, for you know, for an audience. So, so it's funny how sort of, you know, real life and, and you know, the way you write a, a blog and a memoir and a novel in a way all interlink, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, they're all forms of storytelling, aren't they? It's just um, how close or far they are from, from the immediacy of the self, I guess. 
Mm. Does it, um, how does it feel to read those early blog posts now? Have you, do you ever go back to them at this, from this point in time? Um, you know, I found it, yeah, I found it really hard um, writing when I was writing the, the first draft of the, the memoir, reading back through the early days of not drinking and the early days of breast cancer. Um, it's really, you know, it's, you, you look back at yourself and, and you want to go, it's okay, it's okay, it's going to be all right. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah, you, you, there are reasons why you, you can't remember those, those sorts of things that vividly. Um, it's not comfortable. No, I can imagine. And, and like you said, that year of your life sounds like it was, you know, incredibly challenging in a lot of ways. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's wonderful to share those stories because it's, as, as you kind of both been discussing, it's therapeutic for you, but I think it's also therapeutic for anyone who's having a comparable experience to find, you know, you can be, you can't go back to yourself in the past and say it's going to be all right, but you can kind of be the voice saying that to somebody else who, comes across your work and needs that kind of support, um, which is really wonderful. I mean, um, Chelsea, I know that your fiction, your YA fiction, you wrote that before you got sober, um, if I'm right. And yeah, so did your, and, you've, and you spoke just now about finding it hard to write and read when you were drinking, and that was kind of potentially some of your motivation for sobering up. Do you think that you'll go back to writing fiction in your kind of sober life and do you expect it to be different from the fiction that you wrote before? Ooh, I hope so. I, I, I've so already started writing fiction so I've just given my memoir to my agent and then so I, I have free time now. Well I don't have any free time because I'm still working but in theory I have free time now so I've started to mess around with um, fiction and I'd like to think that I would write differently. I'd like to think that I'm more open and I certainly I remember when I was trying to write my second book I was incredibly blocked and I think part of why that was there was a lot of different things but I think part of it was that I'd kind of forgotten the recipe for transformation or I'd, I'd, I'd lost faith in in my own ability to change or in things to change and obviously that's what story is all about and so I just couldn't move my stories through the progression required for a satisfying story. I could come up with a really interesting setting and uh, some great characters and they could sort of have some, you know, there'd be interesting relationship dynamics, but I couldn't kind of like move the story on. And I, I like to believe that this process of change that I've been through has unlocked that in me, but we'll, we'll see when I get to the difficult middle part of the novel, because it's always easy to start, you know. Yes, exactly. Well, that's right. The trajectory can go in so many different directions, right? I think it's also it's just hard to hold those threads in your mind for any long piece of writing, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Claire, your novel, the title of your novel is The Authenticity Project. Mm. Um, and right near the beginning, there's the statement, everyone lies about their lives, which really um, stood out to me, especially in this conversation about authenticity and writing. Um, could you tell uh, everyone a little bit about the novel and the concept behind it? And then I, I also just want to know, you know, everyone lies about their lives. Like, do, do you think that's true? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the book is, is um, uh, the opens when uh, uh, with, a, with an elderly, um, rather eccentric artist called Julian, who um, who gets his little green notebook, and on the front he writes the authenticity project, um, and inside he tells a real truth about his life, um, and he talks about how lonely he is, and he leaves the book deliberately in a cafe where it's picked up by the cafe owner, who's called Monica, and she reads his story and decides to track him down and try and make his life better. Um, and then she does what he suggests, which is she writes the truth about her own life and leaves the book somewhere else for someone else to find. And the book is passed between six different people who all write a truth about themselves, um, something that sort of something important. Um, and they all eventually manage to find each other and they change each other's lives in, in extraordinary ways. So it's really about kindness and community and what happens, the magic that happens when you're really authentic. Um, and in terms of your 
next question, which is, is uh, do I think that people all lie about their lives? I, I think they do to different extents. So, you know, I mean, what it, what the whole, I, you know, the, where the idea came from is the fact that five years ago, um, you know, when I was still drinking, my life from the outside looked like it was all hunky dory. So if you looked at my Facebook feed or my Instagram feed, you know, it all looked really, you know, happy and and all in control and all successful. And the truth was very, very different. So I think even if we don't lie in an outright way, you know, we have way we, you know, it's human nature to always want to put your best face forward. And what we forget is that when we do that, it makes everyone else feel miserable because we all look at each other's social media and we all think, oh God, everyone's having a fabulous time apart from me. <laughs> and then we join in with that whole collusion and do the same thing ourselves. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I think some people, um, you know, some people are big outright fibbers, but most people are just sort of just a, a little bit malleable with the truth and what truth they show. Um, and and the book has is based on six different characters who who are all um, more or less um, authentic with their lives in different ways. I want to come back to to talking about the novel, but actually just bounce back to thinking about memoir because you know a, a memoir is not the same as an autobiography, right? It's not um, such a detailed text normally, and it's usually a little bit more creative or. Um, I don't know, uh, it's storytelling and it, it's storytelling rather than kind of historical information, right? Mm -hmm. And this idea of um, lying about our lives or constructing truths about our lives, which feels really pertinent in the age of social media, right? Of course, as you were saying, Claire, and as it comes up in the novel too, characters who live a, a very different life online than, than they do in reality. But how do you feel about the idea of kind of truth about about your life this is a question for both of you but we'll start with Claire and then and then come to you Chelsea um about representing the truth in your memoirs and how you relate to the active kind of creativity that comes in and um and shapes them because obviously you don't choose you don't write every single experience you've ever had so how do you choose which things you include and which things you leave behind um and what kind of a version of yourself you end up putting forward Oh gosh, that's a tricky one. Um, I my my memoir was was just one year of my life, so I guess the big filter that I did was cutting out, you know, what most of what happened before. So so I used sort of, you know, I referred to my my drinking past, you know, as as I went through the story where it was relevant, um, but really the focus was just that one year. So, um, but within that year, I'm not sure I edited anything much out, to be honest, <laughs> you know, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the thing I find tricky with memoir, and the reason why I don't want to write memoir anymore, and because um, I've had a number of people who've read The Sober Diaries and said, you know, is that you're going to do a follow up or, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I toyed with the idea of carrying on writing um you know writing non-fiction but it becomes tricky when you have kids mm -hmm. because it's not just your life you're talking about it's your children's lives and it's your husband's life and you know and my kids when I wrote the sober diaries were quite young so the oldest one was 11 uh, but now my eldest child is 16 and you know it's not fair on her to publish her life um, you know that's a decision she needs to make herself so um, so I think I think memoir becomes tricky when other people are involved um, you know whether it's friends or family or you know whoever because you it's it's okay for you to tell your story it's not necessarily okay for you to tell the story of other people yes that sounds very sensible I think it's something that a lot of people um, go through even just in their social media world right even people who aren't writers but do they include their children and what's the ethics of including images and stories of people that are not in control of their narrative if they do it that way um, Chelsea what about you how do you feel about the the kind of constructed self of the memoir versus the the real self you know day to day I worry about it a lot too um, because as a writer it's something that I 
I am willing to do and that I think is interesting and important because I love the books where people really do lay themselves on the line. Those are the books that have been so meaningful to me over, over the course of my life. And that's the sort of writer that I want to be. But I also recognize that to many people, it does just seem like the, the craziest thing to, um, like Claire mentioned, sort of air your own dirty laundry. It's, it's a strange thing to do. So I do worry about it. And I've been speaking to other memoirists to get advice about how they've handled that process. And um, I'm not sure that I'm gonna kind of stick with memoir because it is quite anxiety producing. And I think also the whole thing with memory anyway, and, and what we remember and how memory works and how we, we know how fallible it is. And, and then when you're bringing drinking into it as well. So I'm often trying to, I'm trying to sort of recreate what it's like to be going in and out of a blackout, for instance, or to be to sort of fall into drunkenness and to try and capture that. And um, so the idea of myself as an, a reliable narrator is immediately in question. So then when I'm talking about other people and how other people that were around me, you know, that are sort of for, for the moment characters in this story that I'm creating, it is ethically uh, problematic and I think about it a lot and I'm not quite sure what I think about it. I kind of want to go on a memoir workshop and mm. and pick people's brains about it. What do you think, Octavia? Oh, well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's really important to acknowledge that it's a constructed self and that, it's a, it, you, that it is storytelling. Mm. Um, but the thing is all, I think all, and anytime anyone tells a tale about their own life or someone else's life, it's storytelling. Even biographies are storytelling that go through, you know, in minute and usually excruciatingly boring detail, which uh, event someone went to and who they spoke to and the letter they wrote and everything. It's still storytelling because, you know, the biographer has to choose to write the biography. What's their agenda? There's always an agenda. There's always a story that they're trying to tell. When we tell stories about ourselves, there's always a, a story we're trying to tell. So I think, I don't know, I think it's okay. I think basically, I think it's okay that it's constructed, but I think it's good to acknowledge that it's constructed because, you know, you may find, and the interesting thing I think for memoirists is that you end up with this document um, that you wrote at a time in your life about a time in your life. And then maybe 15 years later, you read it again and you think, wow, I feel so differently about all yeah. of that now. And like, how would that be? That's why I think, you know, it's so interesting that both of you have written these blogs because you those are documents that you know you can go back to again and again over time and, and you can reconnect with the self that was authentic when you wrote them but you know the self that is authentic in the future is probably going to be completely different because yay neuroplasticity right like we're changing all the time yeah I'm, um, I'm fascinated by this idea of the stories we tell about our own lives and there's um you know, one of the characters in, in the Authenticity Project, Julian, um, is, you know, he has a very strange relationship with the truth, um, and I, which I found quite fascinating because, you know, and he says at one point, he says, well, if you tell a story often enough, it becomes the truth. And, you know, he, you know, some of, he tells people stories about his life, which are, which are completely untrue, but it's difficult to know whether he actually knows they're untrue or whether actually he has just convinced himself in the telling of those stories over a number of years that that's what really happened. And, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, our, our memories are, are much less reliable than we think they are. And that, the, that's the fascinating thing about blogs as you read back and you realize how, you know, how different the actual, you know, the actual, um, uh, feelings and and experiences were than the way you you now think of them with the benefit of hindsight you know hindsight overlay is a completely different filter on everything absolutely I mean that whole thing about um I don't know if you've experienced this with your families but you know there are certain stories that within families become kind of folkloric and then you'll speak to your parent years later and they'll be like no it, def it just never happened like that but you've been telling everyone I think I think you know that the construction of the self is a pro is a lifelong project that we're all engaged in all the time, just in how we represent ourselves in our daily lives. Like the way we treat other people is a story that we tell in some ways. If you're a writer, obviously those things are much more distilled because they're on the page. I mean, 
Claire, in, in the Authenticity Project, you, you write about um, addiction in, in some of your characters. And uh, I noticed that at the end, you, you wrote a lovely um, acknowledgement about the kind of way it related to your personal experience. And I wanted to ask how it felt to write about that very kind of personal journey in, in a fictionalized context, having done it in a non-fiction context. Um, you know, I, I really, I found it really therapeutic, you know, and I, I talked earlier about the fact that I, I use writing as therapy and fiction, I, fi writing fiction is also therapy because it allows you to explore, you know, it allows you to explore all sorts of things in a safe place because you're not writing about yourself. So, you know, it allowed me to look at the experience of addiction and, and uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the characters addicted to cocaine and alcohol and another is addicted to social media. Um, and it allowed me to explore the feelings of addiction and, and you know, getting through addiction um, in a different way. Um, but it also allowed me to explore, you know, other issues like sort of, you know, one of the characters is a bit of a control freak, which is something I can suffer from sometimes. And, you know, and then, as I said, Julian with his, his um, you know, his issues on truth and reality, which I think is quite fascinating. So, so you know, you can explore things that, you want to understand about yourself through other people. And sometimes I think I didn't even realize that's what I was doing. And it was only actually when my eldest child read the first draft of the Authenticity Project when I finished. And um, she said, mommy, you do realize all these characters are based a bit on you. <laughs> you know? And I hadn't actually realized that until I finished. So um, yeah, so, so again, I think the line between fiction and nonfiction can be really blurry. Even when you're trying so much to record the truth as it happened as well, we're, we're still perceiving it through our filters and our apparatus. And so it's just so limited because when I, you know, I always write, so I've always kept diaries. So I do have a lot of documents to refer to as I'm writing my memoir. But even so, I wrote those documents, you know, and sometimes I wrote them when I was drunk and angry and probably having a really emotional response to something. So I think, yeah, what you say, it's just that trying to build into the memoir, this idea that it is a construction and finding ways to do that um, within the form is really important, I think. Mm. Yeah, I also think it's like, it's, it's a kind of brilliant observation that your daughter made, Claire, because, well, you know, psychologists often talk about how we have different parts of ourselves. And sometimes um, if we experience anxiety or emotional conflict, it's because there's a, a, a conflict between the different parts of the self. And I think mm -hmm. if you're someone who has made a really clear line in the sand change in life, such as getting sober, there's a very clear split in the different parts of yourself, right? You have a part of yourself that was addicted and living in a, a more chaotic, um, potentially less authentic way. And then you have the part of yourself that you've nurtured through getting sober and living differently. And the dialogue between the two, I think can be a really creative space for writing. And actually, you know, I can imagine it being therapeutic to, to put those on the page and give them names and give them faces and, you know, characteristics to externalize that. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's very clear that you both relate to writing in a therapeutic sense, which is brilliant. Do you think that um, reading can be therapeutic as well? Do you guys ever turn to reading for therapy? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, I mean, and th actually the strange thing about the time we're living in now is, you know, I've always used reading as an escape. You know, that's my, you know, it's, it's I think if you're an addict and actually if you're a particularly creative person as well, you you tend to have a mind that doesn't stay still. You know, we call it monkey brain and it just sort of, you know, it's, it's hard to sometimes to relax um, and uh, you know and I always find things like um, mindfulness and meditation very very hard um, and reading for me is a, is a method of, of mindfulness because it takes you out of you know it takes you away from from what's going on in your head and into a completely different world and that's really you know I find that really relaxing and really sort of you know really therapeutic but um, but in the time we're going through now, um, I found it really difficult to read. And it's the first time this has ever happened to me in my whole life. Um, and I just, you know, I find that it's because I think I, I find it difficult to concentrate. So I'll read the same paragraph, you know, several times, which is sort of, you know, which is really frustrating. So what I've started doing is uh, listening to audiobooks. 
Um, and uh, audiobooks have been a complete lifeline for me through lockdown because it's again, it's a way of taking yourself out of, you know, the the you know the real world, but uh, but without having to sort of sit down and and concentrate on on the words on the page, you can sort of do something else while you're listening and just sort of you know. So audiobooks have been my 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 uh, savior. What have you been listening to? Oh, um, so I've just finished listening to Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell, which if you haven't read it yet, is just brilliant. And actually what's so fabulous about it, I mean, not that she's a brilliant writer. I mean, her writing is just beautiful, um, makes you want to weep. It's so good. Um, but um, uh, it's, it's set in a, in a completely different world because it's historical fiction and it's set in, in uh, Shakespeare's um, world because it's all about the death of his, his son. Um, and uh, so, so it takes you to a different place, but bizarrely, um, and obviously she wrote it well before COVID-19 existed, but it's set in a time of plague. So there are some incredible parallels between, you know, the, the time she's writing about and now, um, which, you know, Maggie O'Farrell would, ne would never have anticipated. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what I've just finished listening to, which has been great. That sounds like a great shout. <laughs> um, and Chelsea, what about you? I mean, I've also been finding it really hard to read and focus and, and feel the same, Claire. It's normally something that I go to. Mm -hmm. And I've also been using audiobooks because similarly, it just, it takes that pressure of concentration off somehow, um, but you're still able to escape a bit. Um, but Chelsea, mm -hmm. have you been finding the same or have you been finding reading great? Well, I've been... I've turned to a sort of adventure story. So I've, I'm reading something that a friend lent me a long time ago that I, f I didn't get around to at the time. And now it's just the perfect thing. It's called Tomorrow When the War Began. And it's about some teenagers that live in, the, in Australia and they go camping in the outback. And when they come back, their country's at war and everything's changed and it's suddenly a survival story. And it's just a real page turner. And um, so I'm really enjoying that. And I also listen to a lot of podcasts because, yeah, I can't always I can't always get into books. I think the same. My mind just jumping around a lot at the moment. And um, I tend to read about 16 different books at the same time anyway. And then it'll be a very rare special book that actually sucks my attention in fully so that I have to finish the book, which is what this adventure story has done, which is so great because there's nothing like it, really. Reading is always my my favorite thing. Yeah, an adventure story also sounds like a very good choice. Something that just keeps you focused or like, yeah, like you said, like a page turn that grips you. I've been reading um, a thriller called The Dry, which is... Uh, I I think, read that. Yeah, you, have you read it? Mm, yeah, really good. Jane Harper. That's right. Yeah, it's fab. I'm halfway through, but it's been really like, every time the chapter ends, the next chapter is set up in, a, in like the perfect way for someone who's struggling to concentrate. You're like, oh shit, I need to get there to see what happens. Um, so I guess like, I don't know, we're all sitting here and we're talking about authenticity and we're talking about stories. And, you know, we have to acknowledge obviously the fact that we're also all in isolation, whether alone or with partners or families, but still very much cut off from, you know, the other relationships that allow you to be different parts of yourself, right? And like you have your roles set up in the place where you live. It's impossible to avoid that. And when you're not connecting with, your friends or your lovers or you, whoever else that bring out different parts of yourself, you're stuck in this very like, I don't know about you, but I'm finding it quite a fixed version of myself, which is kind of frustrating. Um, and Claire, your novel is very much about loneliness and the solution to loneliness being obviously community. But I was thinking how that's such an important message in recovery from addiction as well, um, especially with 12 step programs, but I think in general that, you know, addiction is a very isolating place to be and being free from that is, is like being in a world populated by hundreds more people and it's so much better. Um, and, and stories can be like that. Stories can kind of be this population that can lift us out of ourselves. But what are you guys doing to combat that loneliness? And are you finding it triggering any of your kind of less healthy parts of yourself? Um, I'll, I'll ask you first, Chelsea. Uh, that's another good question. Um, I, I mean, the less healthy part of myself gets triggered a lot of the time. So yes, I would say so, definitely. But I, I just have learned new ways to get around that. And one of the huge ways around that is 
connection so it's just calling somebody and asking how they are because whenever I have a if I have a sort of self-destructive urge it's because I don't like the way I'm feeling and I want to feel differently and I can't be bothered to do something good to help myself <laughs> oh my gosh, sorry, there's an amazing giraffe making an appearance in Claire's screen <laughs> oh that's so good that's sorry okay. about that that's one of my kids um so, so that works really well and I kind of forgot the rest of the question but that'll do won't it yeah 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 that will definitely do um what about you Claire are you finding old behaviors rearing their heads or do you feel like it's all um, okay right now yeah it's funny I mean I I, luckily it hasn't made me want to drink because I do realize that that would only make things so much worse than they are in fact actually I wake up every day feeling so grateful that I'm not drinking through this pandemic because you know that would just be you know it would it would be a miserable way of, of trying to cope with it um, uh, but I do in terms of unhealthy behaviors I do find that you know, I turn to sugar, um, for instance. So, you know, so if I'm uh, uh, if I'm feeling particularly stressed, you know, I'll eat cake, and you know, that's not, and you do get to the point where you think, okay, I know this isn't good, but you know, it's it could be a lot worse, and you know, maybe I should just just you know be a bit a bit lenient with myself for the time being. Um, uh, and in terms of you know the, what I try and do to combat those sort of feelings of, of loneliness and and stress and and what have you I mean I found that I've used the phone a lot more than I've used used a phone for for uh, you know for for years in terms of actually talking to people you know so you know I've, I've called you know I've called a number of friends who I haven't had a long conversation with for ages and had really proper good conversations about stuff that matters and I, I think we are you know I've, I've also you know I've seen my immediate neighbors you know um, more just you know from a distance but uh, but you know just in terms of sort of acknowledging each other's existence and and it does feel like we are finding in being forced to to be um, alone we are finding more and more ways to connect um, and and that's really important and I think it makes us sort of God, it makes us realize the value of a hug. Absolutely, yeah. It's a it's a strange thing to be so, um, yeah, to have so few hugs in one's life. <laughs> um, do you think that this experience of the pandemic, and obviously we don't know how it's going to pan out. We have no idea what the world is going to look like on the other side of COVID nineteen, right? The optimist in me says things will go back to something close to what we've understood to be normal. But I think in reality, it's probably going to be quite a different world. Um, do you think that the, these experiences are going to show up in your writing as you go forward? Chelsea, let's start with you. That's a really difficult question as well. I suppose it's it's starting to be quite hard to think about when you're writing, you do need to have one part of you needs to be thinking about a possible audience or where this story who the story is going to appeal to and it's I'm finding it really hard at the moment to to engage with that question at all I mean it's always a difficult question because it's I'm not a marketer I'm a writer you know but it, it does seem it, it's it's quite hard I think I think that Claire's story is such a beautiful story for for now for any time really but for the world that we're going to be emerging into because it's as if lots of the ideas that have been floating around for a long time, lots of things that we all know, we, we've longed for more community for a long time. It's something that people have been talking about. And I feel like um, those sorts of ideas are gonna be fast-tracked and people are gonna be seeing how, uh, how we can create community even when we're isolated in this way. And I think that that will probably be different in the future. And that's something that I care about anyway so I guess it will be showing up in my writing I imagine. What about you Claire do you think that this will will work its way into the work that you make? Um, you know what when when all this started again because I've I've trained myself to use writing as as therapy I wanted to write about it so you know, so I had this urge to write a book about what it feels like to be living in a pandemic. <laughs> I talked to my agent about it and I said, sort of, God, I've got this real urge to write this book about it. And she went, no, 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 don't do it. Um, because 
you know, people aren't, the way that publishers are feeling at the moment, um, and this may or may not turn out to be true, um, is that uh, people aren't going to want to read books about pandemics when we come out of it. We're going to want escapism. We're going to want to sort of, you know, we're going to want to live in different worlds. And eventually we might get to the point where we want to read books about what it feels like to be in a pandemic, but not for some time, possibly. And in, interestingly, if you look at, you know, literature after the Second World War, it was a long time before books came out set in the Second World War um, for that reason. So, you know, so I guess in a way it doesn't, you should write just for yourself and it doesn't really matter what people want to read, but, you know, in a way it does because, you know, it would be a shame to spend a year writing a novel that nobody was interested in reading. So, uh, so yeah, so so I did think about it, but I've, I actually, I think it's best to write about something completely different at the moment. I think that the, the diaries and the blogs or, you know, the personal writing that people are doing right now is probably going to be, be the thing that will be the most interesting to the generations that come after us, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe two generations time, Again, God knows, I'm like imagining them in some kind of weird space pod reading <laughs> in an isolation suit. God knows, I uh, read too much science fiction, but um, for them to read that kind of writing and in some ways like the sort of writing that you guys have both done on your blogs, you know, but about pandemics that I will be interested to, to, to look back on those kinds of things. Um, we've had a, a question come through on the YouTube chat. So thank you everyone who's been saying hello and writing in. Um, and this is for Chelsea, actually. How did you learn what your triggers were and um, what do you do to avoid them? Um, well, I suppose, I mean, I, I learned what my triggers were for, well, let's talk about with drinking as the uh, sort of unhelpful behavior. It turned out they were almost everything. It was um, being happy, being sad, being bored being annoyed, feeling restless, um, feeling great. And so, so I just had to really gradually <laughs> learn how to, um, that's why it's such a big thing to get sober because I have to, had to change so many different things. And it's quite a hard question to answer how have I learned to avoid them, but maybe the biggest way is mindfulness and thinking of others. So trying to stop being so concerned about my own levels of comfort and discomfort has been a big one. Yeah, it's a really helpful lesson of recovery, isn't it? That if you're thinking about someone else, like truly thinking about someone else, you can't be thinking about yourself, which is a great relief because the addict mind is very, very self-focused a lot of the time, you know, it's hard. I've got one now for Claire as well. Um, did you feel that once your memoir was out in the world, it was easier, easier or harder to live as an ex-addict? Um, actually a lot easier because I, I, what I found really exhausting in, in some of the, you know, when I first started confessing to people, I stopped drinking was other people's reactions, you know, and um, I was constantly having to have the same conversation over and over again, which I found very awkward to have because I hadn't quite worked out myself why I wasn't drinking anymore and what sort of, you know, what my life was going to be like. So it was, um, you know, it was difficult to constantly be grilled by people about, you know, about my my addictions. And, you know, I felt that once the book was out there, I had the conversation. And, you know, it's weird in a way because people, you know, you oft I, I all the time I meet people who think they know me really well and I don't know them at all because, you know, they read my memoir and I haven't read theirs, <laughs> you know, so well, they haven't written one. Um, and uh, so, so it is, it's kind of weird, but at the same time, it also takes a lot off my shoulders because I sort of feel that, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to constantly explain myself the whole time because I feel like I've, I've sort of done that, if that makes sense. Yeah, very much so. It is, it's such a strange thing, isn't it? I always think when I'm talking to other sober people about the process that it, it, this this substance that we have in the world that creates so much discord and like it becomes this huge character almost in all of our lives you know like the alcohol question um well we're we're almost 
at the end. So I'm just, I'm going to say to you guys now, Chelsea or Claire, do you have any questions for one another that you'd like to ask? Um, I, I um, just wanted to, to ask Chelsea about, about young adult writing, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm in, you're, you talked about writing a, another novel at some point. Are you going to stick with young adult or do you think you'd move to adult? And why, why, why was young adult something you were drawn to in the first place? And is it still? Uh, I, I really love young adult fiction and I love writing teenagers. I love writing about 13 year olds in particular. I just think it's such a fascinating moment. And, you know, you're sort of, it's, it's kind of the end of your imagination in that way where you can't play in the way that you've, you used to play quite a while before, but it's like, you just don't really have access to that anymore. And you're just very much learning about life and you're sort of half adult and half child and it's it's a sort of dangerous time really and a thrilling time as well so I do tend to uh, write about that age but I don't necessarily need to write about that age for teenagers and I like to think that my books are well I know that they're read by adults as well and actually I've met more adults that have read my books than teenagers I guess that's the way it is with YA we do have a lot of adult readers of course as well and the thing I love about that is the fact that adults have all been teenagers and and some of us are still very close to that part of us um, me because I've cultivated a closeness through the you know through being a YA author and lots of exercises around that um, but a lot of us sort of um, are really in touch with that part of us. And I think also the way that we live now, we're always changing and growing all through our lives and people don't necessarily have the same relationship or the same job all through their lives. So that sort of transitional way of life is, isn't just for teenagers. So I guess, I don't know the answer, but at the moment I'm writing a teenage, a story about a teenager, but I'm also really interested in the mum and the aunt character. So mm. I'm not quite sure which direction I'll take it in, to be honest with you. Just following on from that, actually, Chelsea, we just had a question through asking um, whether you're, as a, as a YA author, do you feel a responsibility to be a role model? Um, I probably should, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> no, not necessarily. <laughs> Maybe I'm not a YA author to my core enough that I feel that. And I guess the one when I wrote mine, um, maybe those kids are sort of old enough now to read my blog about drinking. So I guess I want to be free as a writer. Um, so I, I do feel a responsibility, but I wouldn't want to be too hampered by it. Also, I mean, what does a role model for, for a young person mean, right? It doesn't necessarily mean um, squeaky clean living. I think actually like a good role model for a young person is, is authenticity, right? That's a good goal for a role model. If you're living in line with your, you know, living with integrity and living with integrity doesn't mean living perfectly at all, but like being uh, authentic in the way that you show up for yourself and for the people around you and the clarity with which you can kind of try to see yourself I think that's a, a good enough role model maybe yeah I think next time I will use that answer Octavia that <laughs> you can have it <laughs> um did you have a question for Claire just before we wrap things up I did I wondered if there were any surprising responses to the memoir and also was it worth the feeling of exposure to do it because obviously you started off writing anonymously um yeah if i ask the second bit first um yes it really was worth it and what made it worth it is that you know even two years it's it was published two years ago and i still get emails every day from somebody somewhere in the world who's read it who says um you know I thought that I was the only person that felt like this until I read your book and then I realized that I'm not and that just that feeling knowing that you're not alone and that you're not a freak and you're not sort of abnormal because you can't cope with a addictive substance that other people seem to be able to cope with um is the most amazing feeling and and being able to give people that is a real joy um, so yeah, it was absolutely worth it. And, um, you know, I, yeah, I'm so glad I did it, um, because it's, uh, yeah, it's helped a lot of people. Um, and in terms of, you know, uh, surprising reactions to it, 
Um, uh, oh, um, yeah. I mean, it's I, 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 every now and again I, I read through uh, I read through like the Amazon reviews, and uh, um, I think what's what I find interesting is is the you know the only um, it, the only negative comments I've had haven't been about my drinking at all. You know, people are actually sort of, you know, seem to understand, um, you know, what I was going through. It's, um, you know, it tends to be you know, people um, who object to my, my being middle class and, and my lifestyle. And, you know, and that I, I find is quite tricky because, you know, you do have to get, you know, get, get quite a hard skin. You know, so I remember reading one um, one review. So this lady said um, said uh, I couldn't I, I couldn't warm to this character at all, and I thought she was really this and really that and really whatever. And uh, you know, I thought, hang on, I'm not a character. I'm a person. <laughs> you know? And uh, and yeah, you do you do have to you do have to remember that not everyone is going to like you. You know, and that's fine. Um, I don't like everybody either. You know. So, uh, so yeah, I think generally as an author, you it's it's tricky because you have to be very thin-skinned, and that you have to you have to to feel things quite deeply in order to be able to write about them. But at the same time, you have to have a very tough skin because you know people will criticise you. They'll criticise your writing. If you write a memoir, they will criticise you as a person, and and that's just something you just have to learn to live with. Yes, that, I mean, a lesson for life, right? But really a hard one to learn, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, well, Claire and Chelsea, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna read the little outro script now. Um, so thank you so much to Claire Pooley and Chelsea Flood, and also to all of you guys at home for joining Bookbound 2020 for this event. Um, there are loads of great events like this on our program. So search for Bookbound 2020 on Twitter and Instagram to learn more and help us spread the word using the hashtag Bookbound 2020. If you would like to buy the work of either of our authors today, the links in the text below this video will take you through to Hive, an online bookseller which supports independent bookshops, which really is the only way that you should be buying your books. I'm going to give you a stern look over my nose. Um, <laughs> links to books discussed here and a discount code on selected festival titles are below. You'll also find our author's favourite independent bookshops from across the globe. So you can check them out. You can also, and this is the really important bit, find the Just Giving link to donate to our chosen charity supporting mental health, Mind, below. Please give generously. It's such a phenomenally important cause, especially in these really weird times. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone again and, and goodbye. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.